Hey there. How are you? How are you doing? Welcome. Welcome new and returning viewers. I actually got a handful of new viewers uh, sent over by the Knitting Posse. Thank you, ladies, um, especially Lorian, who gave me a shout out on Instagram. Um, so yeah, welcome. I hope you I hope you enjoy this week's or this um, this Knitter's Life series I began in January and just decided to change up part of the way that I deliver content and to separate that from my old things I or my older style. I just decided to switch it to <clears throat> this Knitter's Life. Um, and have that be the name for the new format. To do, oh, did I say I'm Shannon? My name is Shannon. <laughs> um, my name is Shannon, and you can find me as Whiskey and Wool on Ravelry and on Instagram. Um, lately, I seem to be doing more updating on Ravelry than anywhere else. Uh, I'm trying to be better with Instagram and not let so many days go by before I post. But, you know, anyway, you know where to find me. I am here every two weeks, pretty much, unless something, you know, gets in the way. I might come a little later or a little earlier if I have some event that I'm planning to do. But, you know, there's a pandemic on and events have been pretty thin. So staying on a two-week schedule has been pretty easy. Uh, okay. Today, for the first time... I'm gonna do a gen chat because <laughs> it is getting warmer and I want to just put in mix in some gen chats from here here and there I uh, I love variety so I'm not one of those people who finds a brand and sticks with it I'm always questioning whether there's something better out there or something different or something you know novel um, so I figured what I'll do is every time I buy myself a different brand that I haven't tasted of Jen, I haven't tasted, I'll do that instead of whiskey. So I wanna start today with um, that. And uh, if you're not interested, I will tell you where to skip to right now on screen so you can see, um, go get right into the wool chat and I will you know, talk to you about my knitting when you come back. Hi, something different today. We're gonna taste a gin. Um, okay, so a couple quick things. Gin tastings are done um, pretty much exactly the same way that whiskey tastings are done uh, the, in terms of the process. So you use a tulip shaped glass, um, pour a little uh, shot or so. This is probably more like an ounce, so it's less than a shot and a few drops of water to just open up all the flavors. Um, you, so it's, it's served what we call in the industry neat, which no ice, not chilled, just straight out of the bottle. So that's what I've done here for the tasting. I do have some ice over there because when I'm done, this will become a gin and seltzer with a dash of bitters if I want. Um, that is my normal way of drinking Gen, I don't do gin and tonic because I don't like the sugar in tonic water. Um, so I do gin and seltzer with a dash of bitters, which gives you that same flavor um, of the same flavors of tonic water without the sugar or a sweetener. Some of them are sweetened, and I really cannot tolerate sweetness. Sweeteners. Anyway, today we are trying Sip Smith. London Dry Gin. They do make a few different varieties, some flavors like lemon, uh, they do slow gin, um, and uh, they I saw a strawberry one on their website. They're an interesting place to start. I actually love this this goose with the gooseneck uh, pot, copper pot. They were um, also gorgeous junipers on the back. See the artwork? Very pretty. Company. So I think they say that they are the oldest copper pot still distillery in London. But London has a really long history with gin. England has a very long history with gin. 
Um, as far as I can tell, it goes back to at least the 1600s, probably before. Um, I'm not going to get into the history too much right now. I'll weave that in with future tastings. Um, but I think some of the story will emerge as I'm telling you about the distilleries. Um, this particular one, this distillery is still small. It's still small, considered small batch. It is still um, handcrafted, um, even though it is owned by a big corporation. It's owned by Suntory Corporation, which is a, uh, Suntory is a whiskey, a Japanese whiskey. Um, I don't know what all that that company owns, but they own a lot. <laughs> I'm not going to get into that either right here. Um, they have three copper stills that are in full production. Um, they started to make this mixture in 2009. Um, I think Suntory bought them. I just have to check back on the notes. I believe they were bought by Suntory in um, 2000, I want to say 2012. Yeah, uh, maybe not. I'm not sure when Centauri bought them. Somewhere in the, in the aughts. Um, they became, it became available here in the U.S. or, you know, after 2012. So it's a fairly new gen for us, an old gen for my U.K. viewers. <laughs> Um, they are in a, they've moved location. Um, they're in a location in Hammersmith. I don't know. Wait, the original site was in Hammersmith. They've moved to their current home in Cheswick. So I don't know where that is London wise. It's in London area. I don't know London town very well. Um, sure. Maybe a viewer knows and can answer that question if someone has it. Um, okay, began in 2009 with some friends that teamed up with a third person, so um, they nicknamed themselves the Three Musketeers, I guess. I don't know. Um, not important, but they, um, yeah, they were the ones who really worked hard on developing this. Okay, as you know, gin has juniper that is gin is basically distilled the exact same way as vodka but it has botanicals in it so we're the same base liquid can be vodka or gin depending on what you know this process of adding botanicals through the distillation process um or you know the preparation into distillation that whole recipe thing so gin recipes are closely guarded it's usually pretty hard to get a company to explain too much about what's in them there is a really broad selection of flavors and things that can emerge in the in the recipes um you could have flou flowery notes uh you're expected to have that citrusy that uh, almost like bitter um vegetable taste that you get from the juniper berries um you can have spice, you can have mushroom taste. There's all kinds of tastes that can emerge in gin. Um, so we'll, we'll get into those as uh, they come up, but almost always you're gonna get some sort of citrusy and herbal notes. I generally don't like drinking things that taste flowery, but I do like flowery gins. <laughs> uh, okay, so this one. I can tell you what they have. They have 10 carefully selected botanicals from around the globe. They use Macedonian juniper berries, Bulgarian coriander seed, French angelica root, Spanish licorice root, Italian orris root, Spanish ground almonds, Chinese cassia bark, Madagascan cinnamon, Seville orange peel, and Spanish lemon peel. That is what I'll be tasting. Um, so we'll see what see what we get. Let's see. So it tastes the same. You taste in the same pattern that you do whiskey as well, so you nose it. See what you smell. Str overwhelming citrus to me. And I would, if I had to put my finger on which, I would say lime. Though there's a hint of lemon. Um, getting a little bit, obviously like there's a bit of this juniper, it's juniper forward, so sometimes ingredients will be mixed in such a way that juniper will be in the back or in the middle. 
This is definitely, or up front, this is up front. I really smell that. Yeah, I get the lime, like a citrus, and then the juniper. That, that's mostly what I smell. I'm not smelling too much else. Let me see what I'm supposed to be smelling. Okay, there it is. Okay, also of note, this is around, gin is much cheaper than whiskey, much cheaper. This is about a 40 US dollar bottle. 38, 40, something like that. Okay, on the nose, I'm supposed to be smelling flowers and summer meadow. I guess there's some floral in there. Summer meadow, do they mean grass? I can smell grass. Okay, it's got a spicy middle. What am I tasting at the end? I don't know what that is. Is that the juniper taste? I think it is. It's got a spice, very spicy, like a, there's a little bit of a burn and then you get juniper when you swallow. So I like it. Mm. Ooh, okay. In the so on the nose, I should be smelling the meadow notes, floral, citrus freshness, and juniper. <laughs> then on the palate, juniper leads. Then it reveals lemon tart, orange marmalade, and then those flowers are supposed to harmonize. And then at the end, you get spicy juniper and a hint of lemon tart. That is according to the website itself. In uh, according to another expert, into that's according to the the um, Jen's website. Uh, yeah, it says on the palate strong notes of juniper, but there's also a definite citrus tang. Um, the cassia bark and cinnamon—that's what makes it spicy. Okay, that's what gives us that spice. Um, helps the finish and the overall impression of a classically styled gin that's well-rounded and smooth. So interesting to note that London Dry gins are known for being juniper forward and they have that coriander. So those are two ingredients that you will find in all London Dry gins. So anyway, this is recommended for, uh, so gins will also have different recommendations for what type of drink you should have. This is recommended for gin and tonic style, which my gin soda bitters satisfies that with a lime wedge. So that is the recommended um, way to serve this. Of course, it would make an excellent martini if you prefer that dry juniper taste and that spiciness in the back of your throat or in on the roof of your mouth and the back of your throat as you're swallowing. So good, I like spice. I hope you enjoyed this gin chat. Do let me know, comment below, let me know how you think it went what else you think you'd like to, if there's a brand you want me to try and I can find it. Otherwise, I'm just going to show you whatever I stumble upon. I do have another one backed up for a couple weeks from now, or, or maybe I'll do whiskey and then come back to Jen in another few episodes. that um, I actually don't have any idea what I did I mean because I'm filming it later <laughs> yeah so it is actually late afternoon I thought I would get I love to to get my recordings done first thing in the morning or like shortly after I have my coffee sit down even while I'm finishing my first massive cup of coffee first and only I only have one big double-sized coffee every day it's also allergy season. I am allergic to oak trees. So when oak trees start their pollination, which happen, that's like, if you live in the no Northeast, the oak tree pollination is what makes your car, 
this like yellowy green color, at least in this area where I am. There's a lot of varieties of oak trees and they are all over the US, but oak trees in this region really, really, really get me going. Like I am on allergy medication. This, this two weeks of May, the first two weeks of May are really bad for me. <laughs> well, I have itchy, watery eyes. So if my eyes look a little poofy or red, it's because of the allergies. Um, so I hope if you have allergies, you're also able to um, find some comfort. It's making me tired. It's making me pretty tired. Um, the best medication I can tell you is uh, is now, I used to, it used to be prescription, now it's over the counter. It's called Flonase. It's a steroid nasal spray that you do not get addicted to. That's what I use when I need extra strength <laughs> with the allergy season. Uh, you are here for wool though. We were gonna talk about wool. Um, I don't have any finished objects, but I have made progress on stuff. Oh, and I'm wearing the Donna, I think it's just called Donna, by, um, oh my gosh, I want to say it's a Spanish, Spaniard woman. Um, I cannot, I do not remember her name right now, so I will put it on screen. But this sweater is called the Donna, I, or Donna, I made it in 2018. So it was a few years ago, out of just some MCN, um, two colors that I really like together. I just really love this bright and tearful sweater for this time of year. It's just says spring to me. Um, so that's what I'm wearing. Martha's wearing a whip. She's, I, I, I made it through the body on the watermelon sweater. So this is the watermelon sweater, which is from Bauhaus Stickening. Do I have the book over here? I do. Yay, so I'm gonna put it on screen and just show you. It's from this book right here. This is the only place that the pattern is um, published. It is, uh, you know, it's not a Hohe Locatelli pattern. It is like, meaning like they're very well written and have a lot of detail and tell you everything you need to know. The patterns in this book um, are written in you know, pretty vague way. The pattern, the entire pattern fits on one page and then the charts on another page. I think I'm gonna have this done by next episode. Um, so just super quick, you can go back and watch my old episodes if you wanna know more. Um, the company knit sweaters and sold the sweaters. They didn't sell the patterns. The Putting the patterns together in a book is something that came later um, and it was by, um, Vivica Overland and if you're not catching all of the details of the book and stuff I will have everything down in the description box as well as linked over on Ravelry um, The yeah, it's, but this has a bunch of patterns probably 20 or 25 patterns um, The size range is not great. It is um, I think it basically like SML XL so only four four sizes um, but I think it's pretty easy to size up because it is written actually for thinner, like kind of lacy weight, lace weight yarn. Um, and I knit it in fingering weight. I used um, a bunch of mini skeins from the Gray Sheep Company in the UK. And for the body, I decided to hold two strands of mohair together. As you can see it's a little transparent, but, but I mean, this isn't a sweater I wouldn't wear over a t-shirt like Martha has. A t-shirt under it. I haven't blocked it yet, so I expect more to more to happen to that. Um, the mohair is I picked this one. I don't know why. Oh, because I wanted a really white one. I wanted a white mohair, so it's uh, by the yarn company Ito, and it's called Sensei, and it is a 60/40 mohair silk uh, core spun yarn. And yeah. I bought it from Brooklyn General. I buy a lot from Brooklyn General, fabric-wise and uh, yarn-wise, because she has a nice selection of indie dyed yarns and some specialty yarns and stuff. Um, I'll just give you an idea of the range of sweaters. There's the watermelon one right there. Their watermelon version was dark green. I went ahead with white. They use like an Angora... Um, 
kind of, I think it was an Angora blend, lamb's wool Angora blend for their sweaters, but apparently the sweaters sold for a few, a couple, I don't know what it would be today, three or four hundred dollars, but it, even then they were expensive because there's a lot of stories in the book. The, this book tells the story of the company if you're interested, so you can see on the back the, um, the ladies. Um, and they did it to help the uh, families in Sweden that were struggling. They, they, this woman, this philanthropist, uh, established the company to help um, bring those women, help those women bring income to their homes. So, um, oh, and I didn't finish telling you that the Bauhaus style, what makes it Bauhaus is that um, the the chart is something different every single row, so it's not like the same motif that you're just repeating like you would in a fair aisle. Uh, it is, it also has pearl stitches, so that's like a very, um, which I don't know if you could see too well, but you could, yeah, right here you can see it a little bit, right there, and then up there. So there's pearl bumps in the color work too, and those pearl bumps, they really make, give the color work like a very interesting and different type of um, texture, like that, adding texture into the color work, of course they add texture, but um, it, it's really, it, it really gives it a very unique and different look. And I don't have to get too into the weeds because I was thinking to myself, this is gonna be kind of a short episode, but if I keep chattering away, it's not gonna be. Um, there was one, there's one sweater pattern in here, which I don't, I don't remember what it is. Um, so I'm not going to show you, but there was one in here where the texture was really like, it almost looked like a different color, the, the way that just because they textured the yarn uh, or textured the knitting you, doing using pearl stitches. But yeah, I will do a full recount of the every, you know, the yarn and with the yoke and all of that next time, next episode. I did, I have gotten into more detail if you're craving more detail on this in my previous episodes, not last week or not my last episode, not episode nine, but I did talk about it briefly, but I think I really got into detail probably in the first episode that I showed it, um, which you can always know what episodes I talk about my each project by looking at my Ravelry page and the notes I always put each episode that I brought um, what I'm, one of my projects up and if I talked about it, it's it's, it's there, it's, it's in the box and you can just watch. And usually the first episode when I have a project is where I really have a lot of info. Okay, that got a lot of work. You know what happened? I was like kind of plodding along on it, just like, you know, doing a few rows here and there of just this like plain stockinette because I'd finished the color work last two weeks, more than two weeks ago, like three weeks ago probably. Um, and I was just kind of going along, going along. And then all of a sudden I realized I was getting pretty close to the bottom. So I just like the last couple days have just been on a marathon with it. Just like push myself to get to the point where I could cast off the body. And yeah, now I'll do the sleeves, which sleeves go pretty fast for me. So I imagine I'll have this done by even not knitting other things. I'll still probably have the sleeves done by my next episode. Hooray. <laughs> Couple of the things did get some work. I, um, I, I finished the sock I was knitting. This is the um, Drea Renee, D, I think it's just DRK everyday sock pattern that I'm trying out. Um, it And the yarn is my own hand spun out of, um, so I have left, I actually have a, um, I'm starting on the heel here of the second one. But let me just, let me, as I talk about it, let me just hold up this one. Uh, okay, yeah, so this is the DRK Everyday Sock Pattern by uh, Andrea Mowry, and uh, the yarn is my own hand spun. It's a fingering weight that has, it's a blend. It has uh, mostly wool, it has some mohair in it, has a little bit of silk and a little bit of nylon. And I think it actually has some sparkle too because I think I see sparkle every once in a while. Yeah, so the heel is a flegal heel, which I'd never done before. It is a toe-up pattern. Maybe some of you have already made this. I never did toe-up before either. I'm a very inexperienced sock knitter. I actually um, knit a total of 
four pair, five, five pair. Um, yeah, so that was my only experience making socks. I made je- Jelly Roll socks, which is um, orange. I think our name is Orange Knits on Ravelry. The Jelly Roll sock, uh, little, you know, um, no-show socks, basically. Shorty socks, that's what they're called. Uh, I made that for my son, and uh, those took me eight months because I just wasn't into it. I, not, I really wanted to, ha- to give them to him, to make them for him. That wasn't the part that I wasn't into. It was just the, the fiddling with, you know, magic loop. And I just, I don't know, I just wasn't, I wasn't feeling it. But as I was spinning this beautiful yarn from Green Goat Ranch, I got into, I started to sort of fantasize about what beautiful socks they'd make with that mohair in them. Because if you don't know Green Goat Ranch, uh, Sarah, the owner, has um, mohair Angora goats. She's got Angora goats and she, you know, they get sheared I think twice a year and then she takes the locks and dyes them and she sells them naturally too. She has a bunch of stuff in her shop right now because it's Maryland Sheep and Wool. So if you're a spinner and you're interested, she's got stuff for you. Um, Art bats and beautiful art bats and batlings and stuff like that. And so this this was one, one, um, one batling. One, like, was it one or two? Two. I bought two batlings for it. That's right. Because I ended up, it, the batlings are about an ounce and a half. And I needed three ounces to get a full fingering weight skein. So anyway, yeah. I fell in love with the yarn and decided it had to be socks and went looking for a pattern that maybe I could and then I just said I decided I would just breathe in and breathe out and just not think I know everything about how to make a sock and just start over like let me just start over and do some different techniques and figure out what works for me so that's what I did um so Andrea Mowry's pattern is a toe-up sock uh, with a flegal heel, which I'd never done. The tr- uh, vintage sock pattern that of my own is, not my own, but the one that I have on my page is um, heel flap and gusset. And yeah, so I do like toe up. I didn't think I would, but I do really like it. I have to say though, I, I went really quickly until I got to here, and then this was a little slower. This, the stocking part was a little slower. I do think I made it too big. I think I should have, um, I think I actually need to knit a size lower. I think it's too big around for my foot. Like there's, I just think there's no negative ease. And the length, there's no negative ease for length. And I might be wrong, but there should be negative ease, right? In the length and stuff. But I just didn't realize that. I guess that would be the advantage of going top down. Um, from here down down to the toe is that I would have been able to figure out exactly how long it needed to be but then you're always doing these parts you know after like so Andrea's pattern says knit to a certain point which I put a I just put a stitch marker there knit to a certain point and and um minus three and a quarter from of the length of your foot so that's what I did I knit to here which I think was like six inches and then I was like, okay, I just need three and a quarter more inches. This is this is where my insep starts. Like this is where my you know my foot starts to curve up. But it turns out like this is the exact size of my foot in terms of length. And I think they it should be like when I compared it to other hand knit socks, it's that socks have been that had been made for me. This was probably about three quarters of an inch too long. It just felt like maybe there should be negative ease but so I'm gonna try I'm game to try it again (laughs) I want to get this right so I'm gonna finish this pair I'm gonna see how they wear and see see how I like them see how they block out because maybe they'll maybe the length will shorten as the rib kind of pulls up right you know also I'm not sure I'm gonna like having a rib foot I might want the foot to be smooth I'm not sure um so anyway I'm gonna try them out see what happens we're going into sandal weather here soon but there's still some days of socks ahead at least till June we don't really it doesn't really get warm in this region until 
Till I would say like June, like warm, warm, like really, really where like every day is warm. We, we get hot, you know, periods of warm days and then periods of cool days and cool evenings. And though I don't know, those knitting posse women, they're putting their sweaters away. I was like, what? <laughs> I won't be doing that for a while. Um, yeah, that's my sock, my sock uh, stuff. I can't, I will say though, um, as many of you know from watching some of the clips and stuff that I intersperse about my, you know, daily life, I, um, well, I'm working from home for one thing. I'm fully remote up until, at least until June. Um, and then I'll probably just be back in the office one or two days a week for a long time. I don't know if I'll ever go back full time, actually, full time in the office. Because um, so much of what I do, of the work that I do, I can ease, I'm, I don't, I talk to people through the internet. I don't really talk to people face to face to do most of my job. Um, so, yeah. So where was I heading with that? Oh, okay. So, you know, you may know too that I, uh, part of my daily routine is taking my cat out for a walk. We spend about 20 minutes uh, walking outside. Um, he has a harness and I have a leash with me. I don't always keep him on the leash if he stays near me. I only leash him when he is um, looking like he's getting into something where I really won't be e uh, able to easily get him out of. So like if there's some thick bushes or grasses or something that I I'm gonna have to like climb through. I'll put the clip him on the leash so that I can easily pull him back out without having to hurt myself trying to get him. Um, or if he's too close to, if he strays too close to the neighbor's yard, I'll clip him just so to keep, you know, to show him that this is a boundary and we don't we don't want to cross that. Um, so anyway, yeah, 20 minutes every day or so, which is it's pretty mind-numbingly boring to walk a cat. But having a little knitting has really helped. So, and having a small project has been nice. Like it's really helped me kind of enjoy the walk because I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm accomplishing something besides just like staring at my phone or watching him just sit. Like he'll walk a little bit and then he wants to sit and watch, um, you know, look around. Um, last year we uh porch we sat on the porch a lot in and i have a cat pen for him like a, it looks like a play pen but it's made for an animal made for like a small dog or a cat and that was really nice for me but he didn't like that so much but that was his sort of introduction to being outside um we had gone outside from time to time but we started to make it a regular routine thing once the pandemic started last last spring um, and yeah, so he was in the pen for most of last summer and then we transitioned to the harness and leash. So he got used to being outside and got comfortable and got interested in watching um, the birds and the other animals and chasing, you know, butterflies and all of the those fun little catty things. So yeah, this has been a real lifesaver, like having um, a sock to knit as I walk him. And that's how I've done most of the knitting on that, on these socks. So I've really, you know, 20 minutes a day adds up. So I should have these done next time too, I think. So I am working on the heel. Ah, okay, next, next whip. I have also made some progress. I actually, on my stone crop cardi, here it is. It is a pattern that you steep. This is also another Andrea Mowry pattern. Um, it is one that you knit in the round and then cut in the front. Um, so you steak up the front for your neck bands. And I got a little bit done, about like maybe a four inch section. Um, this is a sweater that you wear a little bit on the shorter side. But I, I mean, I think Andrea's, I would say, of course, I've put a picture on screen by now. But in Andrea's... I would say hers is definitely cropped on her and this is my second one of these I made another one um, so I've been looking at that one a lot to sort of understand how much how long I want this one and that one was about 19 inches uh, so in looking at this 19 inches from center front down um, 
in looking at this, I, I realized that I only will do, let's see if I can show you easily. I will only be doing, I'm on a, like a bobble, a bobble section, or I just finished a bobble section. I'm on a color work section just underneath. So say it's like, like I'm, I'm here in this section, for example, like this is the same. I'll be knitting through here, another bobble row, and then maybe another checkerboard and that'll be it. And then I'm doing the rib and, and binding off the body. So I'm really close. And I actually thought this was gonna get done before this was just cause I, and I wasn't like pushing myself to do one thing or the other. I was just kind of knitting on whatever felt good. And you know, this feels really good to work on. Um, cause it's, you're, you know, you're, you're changing, you're doing a, uh, like a pattern for about six or so rows, six or four, four to six rows. And then you're doing something different. So it's really, it's really engaging. Um, it does require a little bit, like it's hard to watch a movie or anything with subtitles with knitting this because you're looking down from time to time at your progress. But if it's just a show, like it's really great for watching knitting podcasts and things like that because you don't have to, you know, you listen without having to keep your eyes glued to the screen. So this is great for that type of knitting. Um, oh, I gotta tell you about the yarn. <laughs> so I'm talking about the yarn for a minute. Um, this is the new uh, Brooklyn Tweed, Tweed Ranch yarn called Ranch 03. I don't remember what it's made out of. I wanna say it is, do I have it? Why don't I have it? Um, okay. I'm gonna put on screen what it's made out of. Um, this is the colorway Pluot. It came in about 10 colors. So it is a limited yarn. It is limited quantity. Um, Brooklyn Tweed has been making a ranch yarn every year. This is their third year. That's why it's Ranch 3. So they have Ranch 1, which I haven't. Ranch 2 I saw in a store recently. Ranch 1 online store because um, I'm not going anywhere until I'm fully vaccinated, uh, which I almost am Monday. I get my second vaccin vaccine. Uh, yeah, so anyway, uh, two I saw in an in a online shop recently. This one is, I think two was a DK weight, so this is a fingering weight. Um, the concept is that they take um, the wool from one ranch or another and... Um, <coughs> Um, like one, a single ranch. So it's sheep to skein from a, sh with Brooklyn Tweed doing all of the, helping the rancher do the transition from fleece to, yeah, all the way through. I mean, they own it, they buy the wool and then they take it through all the processes. So 100% US made, um, grown and made here. So it's really great. It's a great project, pro product and project. And I absolutely love the, um, th this yarn, this Ranch 3. It's got such great definition and stuff. So I feel like I'm doing a really lousy job telling you about this, but nevertheless, I'm gonna persist. <laughs> the contrast yarn is Spin Cycle, which is the, what the pattern was written for. I think the pattern was the main color is Magpie. But anyway, Spin Cycle, this is the color Summer Love. I've been obsessed with yellow lately, by the way. Um, yeah, anyway, Summer Love. This was a special batch that was called an Ish Tent and sent to Starlight Knitting Society. All the Ish Tents, so it's Summer Love Ish. Um, what, all the Ish Tents are sold by Starlight Knitting Society. They are nearby the Spin Cycle um, mill. The green at the top is this color, it's called Cataclysm. I just saved a bit so that I have it for the bottom of the sleeves where you know the colors are supposed to repeat. But, okay, um, as I was working on this, I was starting to realize that I probably wasn't gonna have enough of this to finish the sweater I think it will be very close and I don't really want to play yarn chicken so I went on a little search for more of this um, 
And I started to think, well, I could probably combo in something else that's got yellow in it. I have a skein that has some yellow in it, but it's not gold like this, it's yellow. So I just decided, I just bit the bullet and, and bought, I found Summer Love, not an ish tint, but Summer Love at another store. And I also found um, another color on the Spin Cycle Yarn website. Oh, Deep Bump, which is a, I have Deep Bump in the Dream State and it's like kind of a minty bluish green. The Deep Bump on the web, on the website, on Spin Cycle's website, looked like this. It was like a lot of gold and gray. Um, there was some that were lighter gray and some that were darker gray. So I just said, can you give me a very golden sh um, skein? So, and then I, so I bought that first because I thought I was gonna get completely stuck. And then I um, when and I figured if it's skewed towards green, that's fine because I'm working some green in here. And this um, Summer Love-ish does have some greenish blue in the mix. So I was like, mm, okay, this might work. So um, yeah, and then I went ahead and found Summer Love somewhere else. So I went and I bought, a, you know, so I have two more skeins. I've spent so much for using up stash. <laughs> but it's spin cycle, so yeah, it I'll use it for something. Um, so anyway, I yeah, it's on its way. They're both on their way. So when they get here, I'll see which one looks best, and then that'll be the the second skein that I'll use for this. By the way, I don't think I shared this with you, but I did buy the shawl bag. Again, yellow, yellow. The one that Ho he did with Stephen West, so it's, I don't know if you could see there, it says with Stephen West. Um, so this is supposed to be a bag that Stephen helped design and Ho he sells in her shop. Um, I thought it would be bigger than it is. It's awfully small. I do not know if I could fit a shawl in there. I certainly couldn't fit the shawl in here that I'm knitting currently. Um, I prefer like, more bucket bags like the Pampa bucket um, for knitting patterns that have a lot of colors that where I have a, a few different skeins of things but it's a nice bag I like it um, it does kind of naturally flop open if I just set it down it'll just do that it'll just like flop open um, I mean if I had less in there I guess it would stay shut more likely to stay shut um, but yeah, it's pretty, it's beautiful. It's, I mean, like all of Hohe's bags, if you haven't, um, gotten a chance to either purchase one or see them in person, they're really, really beautifully made. Like it's, this will last a lifetime and probably two, if it's well cared for and not abused. <laughs> I won't abuse it. I'm talking about whoever gets it after me. <laughs> but yeah, I really love it. It comes in, she makes it in six or seven colors um yeah okay moving on the other thing that I worked on and I have an update on is my half and half wrap by Pearl Soho free pattern on the Pearl Soho site oh and unfortunately I am in the middle of a row but I'm going to put a picture in I'll just show you here how much I've done. So I am almost done with that yellow. I'm almost done with that bright yellow. It goes all the way up to the end of the black and then I switch to the last color. So this is the last color section. Um, I am doing, so I'm doing the half and half wrap. It is designed for, um, it is designed for their linen quilt, for Pearl Soho's linen quilt. Free pattern on Pearl Soho site. I have put pictures in already of it, um, of the gorgeous uh, woman wearing one and another picture probably of it folded in half. It's designed to be two colors, so it's two triangles, it's, you're making a square essentially. So half of the square in a triangular fashion, like splitting it diagonally, you have one triangle that's one color and one triangle that's another color. And you knit using short rows so you... Uh, so you create the, cri the triangle using short rows. So you cast on, this was my cast on over here. I don't think I'll lose the needles with this because it's pretty, yeah. Here was my cast on. 
this gray color. Um, and what I did, because I wanted to use yarn that was in my stash, I went stash diving and I found um, the, this combo, this black and white combo from the same maker. So all this yarn is by Loop Fiber Studio. Uh, Steph, of Loop. Steph is having a 20% discount in her shop this weekend for Maryland Sheep and Wool. Everything. No code. Just go. Um, so if you love this yarn or if you're a spinner and you want some fiber to spin, she's, though she, she was running low when I looked about an hour ago. Um, yeah, so I just, I used, I, I had single skeins. I had obviously had two of this um, salt and pepper. I only had one black. I had one bright pink, one soft yellow, one bright yellow. And I have, I have a couple other colors. I have like a bright blue, I have a burgundy and a khaki color. She makes like 20 colors. And then she does this um, bright light thing. So this is where the yin yang comes in. So a bright, bright yellow, light yellow, and then in the black and white, it's like this, black, white. So it's not really white, white. You're getting kind of a gray salt and pepper, and then you're getting pepper and salt on this side. So it's pretty cool, pretty cool concept. She has them in fingering weight and in worsted. So you can do some nice, you know, color blocking style stuff. Um, yeah, so that was, so I had all of these in my stash and I just wanted to knit from my stash. And that's how I ended up um, on this. So my plan was to knit um, until the skein ran out and then do the next skein and then the next skein. And when I was working <laughs> with this skein, the third skein, it should have been just, it, the, it's a six skein pattern, so I should have been able to get through three skeins on one side, three on the other. When I was using this, I was like, mm, I don't think I'm gonna have enough to make it all the way through. I did a little math with some, you know, per, doing the percentages, and I was like, it's not gonna make it. So, I ended up pulling out the light yellow that I had, and I used that to finish up the first triangle. And you can see the line right here. This is where the two triangles go together. So here's the one triangle, and here's the second one, and they miter. Yeah, you're looking at the wrong side. It's much nicer on the right side. Um, they miter into a nice V, and they will, so it will miter again where the yellow, it miters where the yellow and pink match. I didn't match it up as well, but it's pretty good. It's good enough, right? And then it'll miter again when I switch to the next color. Yeah, so, and the, with the light yellow, because I didn't use that much, I decided to just continue the light yellow on the other side. So that's what happened there. I could have just bought a black skein, I guess. Anyway trying to use stash. <laughs> so as I was knitting the bright pink, I thought to myself, maybe because I've got two, these two, this yin and yang go together. I've got the two yellows. I'm doing pink and then I was planning to do the bright blue. I was like, maybe I should just do the light pink. So I went ahead before I knew she was going to have a sale. I went ahead and bought us a, a skein of the light pink. And so this will be the last color. So this side, I'll show a picture. I'll show you a picture. So the, the pink will be, it's, so the one side is, is uh, white, black, we'll just call it white, white, black, white, pale yellow on both sides, bright pink, bright yellow, paler pink. It's pretty bright, it's pretty bright pink. Yeah, yeah, so no regrets. I think this is the way to go. Um, I thought hard about just maybe doing the blue, but I do think, I think the addition of the pale yellow at the top or on that, in that one section really kind of changed my mind um, because this was my original sketch. Hopefully you can see, yeah, there you go. That was what I thought it was gonna be. So I thought the blue was gonna be, it would just be black, black, white, or white, black, white, and then it was gonna be pink, blue, yellow. 
Yeah, so it's just changed my perspective. <laughs> I actually have, funny enough, weirdly, I have extra pink. A lot of extra pink. It's pretty significant. Um, so I don't know what happened with those first couple skeins. I don't know if I was knitting tighter, knitting looser. I don't know. I'm pretty consistent with my knitting, though. Uh, that is all that I've been working on. I do still have the Stripes sweater by Andrea Mowry, which I haven't, I didn't show last week. I last showed it in episode eight. So I, that, that is still like over, um, I didn't put it in my whip graveyard. And I'm also still planning to clean that graveyard out this year and have nothing in there by the time I reach the end of the year. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> So, okay, this, this is a future, future project. I, um, I filmed, I filmed me, uh, sorting through some stash yarn for a future cast on. Uh, so I'm going to just show you that now. Um, and, uh, then when you come back, I'll talk to you about spinning and I will, yeah, we'll do a little self care and episode will be over. Yeah, so go enjoy. Go enjoy. Okay, so I am going to join the crochet along in May um, with Christy Glass Knits and Knit and Escape. They're like, it's her company, um, her retreat company. So you need anywhere from 20 to 30 mini skeins to do this project which is exciting because I really want to use these gorgeous mini skeins I have right here for something. I also pulled out my scraps of fingering weight yarn and generally in here aside from this messy pile I have um, in the bags things are sorted by color so like these are the gray tones, these are pinks. So I'm going to go through these and put together um, a few combinations. I'm going to aim for 20 colors, I think, and see where I land. Okay, so this is what I think I'm going to do. Um, each section has seven stripes, so I pick seven colors for each striping area, so, and, and the little um, diamond thing. So here, this is section one right here. Uh, section two and section three. Actually, I'm not sure which order I'm going to put them in yet, but yeah, this is what I'm thinking. I was able to use up some leftovers from old projects. Uh, that's just a mini that I had um, caked up and used a little bit for something, which I don't remember what it was right now. Uh, same with that. That's a mini that I caked long ago. That these this is left over too. This and that are cat sandwich fiber, which I really wanted to work them in. And then this is some old sock yarn that I may end up using for the trim because there's a, a yarn that you need for the trim all the way around. This is a significant amount. Slight update. I changed this section up a bit. I put these two in. These are scraps from the leftover project. And I put this in and I took out... Um, uh, that and another light pink that was in there. Look at how pretty that is together though. It looks so great. Really love it. Um, that stayed the same. And then this, I just moved, popped this little drip, bit of purple over here. This is only about 12 grams. So um, I may use it with this grouping here or not. I don't know. 
trying to figure it out. I just decided this has to be one end or the other. I just love it so much together. Um, and I love this. I love that swamp green and the way it's playing with the brighter peaches in here and stuff. Yeah, so I, I just flipped these over so I could just see how they look together. I wanted to make sure each section made a story. So I originally crocheted when I started to crochet when I was eight years old. I just did simple, I actually was crocheting wrong. Um, my aunt showed me how to crochet and then I just kind of figured like I just, I mean it was, it was the 70s and I didn't have internet then so I couldn't look it up. I only could get my hands on, you know, some instructions and I didn't really know the difference between single crochet and half double crochet and double crochet so I really wasn't even crocheting correctly and I was only just crocheting little craft items and whatever I did worked because it was just I was consistent with my stitches so that worked um, I was making like I made a whole bunch of I made I think I made a scarf or something and I made um, some toys or things like that. I don't, I don't really remember. A couple Christmas ornaments. I learned really how to crochet somewhere in high school. Like I learned that I was doing things wrong. I must have gotten my hands on some book. Oh, I know what I got my hands on. I'm sure you still have it. After all these years, I wasn't that close to the candle. It probably looked like it, but I wasn't. Okay. I got my hands on this. This was printed in 1979 and I was in high school then. Um, it doesn't say crochet, but it does have crochet in it. So it has all these, it, I still use it. Like this is still a great reference and there's such great information in here about everything, about all, like just lots and lots of, um, there's actually the knitting is pretty good. Like there's lots of things about how to, how to fix your knitting. I mean, just really awesome. Look at that. How to correct your errors. Look at all the ways. I mean, the illustrations are fantastic. Like you could, these books are really hard to, I mean, now it would be easy with digital, but back then, like to do this type of these sketches and print them, it was a lot. Um, and there's a lot of photos too. There's like a stitch library. So that's just the knitting section. The crochet section is equally um, beefed out. There's a lot of stuff about finishing your knits. There's also projects. There's also, it's not just knitting and crocheting. There's also how to make lace and all kinds of really fun things. How to make fringe, how to make rugs, um, embroidery, quilting. So I have, like, I've held on to this book. So this book showed up. My mom probably bought it. And I learned that I was crocheting wrong. So me and my friend, who was also into crafting, she and I you know, retrained ourselves how to crochet properly from using this book. So that's how I learned that I was doing it wrong. And then after that, I discovered, I finally like, so my mother, sorry, I'm like kind of going off on a tangent here. My mother is lefty and she thought she could not teach me. She knitted and she crocheted. She did all kinds of crafts. She did my macrame, she did stained glass. She did a lot, a lot. She was very crafty. She did crafts a hobbyist. Um, she is lefty and thought she could not teach me how to knit, but it turns out righties and lefties knit the same, but they crochet opposite. So a lefty will hold a crochet hook in the left hand, a righty will hold it in their right hand. Um, and then everything's mirrored if you're a lefty. So a lefty could watch what the righty's doing on this side and then easily figure. so that's also how I was able well, my aunt taught me how that's why my aunt taught me to crochet because my aunt is a right-handed person and I'm right-handed so that that was why she <laughs> I had to wait for my aunt to teach me um so yeah anyway my mom would not teach me how to knit because she didn't know that lefties and righties knit differently and I think I've told the story before my she did teach my older sister to knit my mom was a thrower. She's an English knitter. She doesn't knit anymore. She doesn't do any crafts anymore. She's very disabled. But um, my mom was a thrower. She knit English style. And she, because she thought that everything was opposite for a right-handed person, she taught my sister how to knit. And my sister's a continental knitter. Pretty funny, right? I learned English because I learned from a book. 
I learned from this book. <laughs> and it does talk about English and Continental. And I think, I mean, Continental would have worked for me because I was used to crocheting and crocheting, you hold the hook in one hand and the yarn in the other. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how I just ended up as an English knitter. I'd probably tried both and then just went with it. Um, I really earnestly began knitting in college because Vogue Knitting magazine came out again. Like, so it came back. It had been out and then it went out of print and then it was back again. I think it came out in like 81. So I was in college by 82 and I was like loving that magazine and so that a lot of and I and I was I was in a college in upstate New York where there's a lot of farms so I you know could buy farm yarn pretty inexpensively and knit make a sweater for twenty dollars so yeah so that is my the, how I learned how to craft story in a nutshell that's that's the teacup version of my story um so yeah I haven't crocheted I have not crocheted since high school so I'm going to try it. Um, I got very interested in doing this crochet along um, because it of the consumption of minis. And I was like, this is going to use how many minis? <laughs> how much of my stash am I going to use up? Um, because the minis that you saw in the clip were from my advents, uh, from 2019 advent from 2020 advents and a couple other you know times where I've gotten minis as gifts from people or I've gotten I just picked up a mini um I think I bought a Halloween mini set probably in 2019 because I definitely did not buy one in 2020 and then I had all those leftovers I have lots of leftover yarns so yeah I am excited to here's my yarns are all ready all caked and ready for the first section um, there are, I talked about three sections in the clip. There are four sections to the Ziggy interrupted pattern. Um, however, the total yardage you need is only, uh, five skeins worth. Four? Yeah. Yeah. 20. So it'd be the equivalent of 20 minutes. I, I no. want to use, I mean, I want to use these things up. I don't want to have a little leftover Dra dribs and drabs of these colors. So I really want to use them up. So I'm going to try, I've got 23 colors in that, in this beautiful bucket bag. Isn't that great? So big, perfect for like this type of project. Um, I'm going to try to use them all up instead of bringing in other colors, but I have a lot of similar colors. So if need be, I can put in another color. Um, Christy Glass and hers, she used 29 colors, 20, 29 minis, and did not use up all of them. So all of each skein. She used all of those colors, but she didn't use all of those skeins. But I have plenty of yarn. So, I, I mean, at first I was like, oh, my God, maybe I need more minis. Like, maybe I should just buy a set. And then I'd have, like, a set that goes together, and I don't have to try to make it go together. Um, but I'm just going to try to deal with this stuff. So I'll make different pairings of, um, I'll create a fourth section out of the, the yarn that I have. <laughs> Cause I have, I know what I want for the ends. Like I know what I want for those two sections. So I may do those two sections first and then figure out the middle by kind of doing them overlap and mix and all of that. Um, I did buy this to help me, <laughs> help me learn a little more about uh crochet and it turns out like there's so much stuff in here there's a lot of like really basic info and i think the terminology is a little more up to date than this book so i'm gonna use this i think as a reference for when i need help with how to do something and it also has like all these awesome um granny squares i am a granny <laughs> i am a granny um, so it has all these really, I really love this, like how there's dimension to this. So I may, because there's time, like I have three or four weeks before the crochet along starts. I think I'm going to try, maybe not this one exactly, but maybe this idea of doing some dimension. Um, yeah, I'll just use some scraps or something and try to make 
something a little more interesting for the square part of Zuggy Interrupted. I'm taking my inspiration from Sweet Nestings. She's on, I only see her on Instagram. I think, I don't know where else she might, you might be able to find her, but she, she is the person who, um, these bright, these bright pink, all these bright pink minis are from when I did her advent calendar in 2019. It, she loves bright colors. If you look at her feed on Instagram, it's full of bright, bright colors. Anyway, she started her Ziggy Interrupted a while ago. She said she's it's very addictive. And she did these really dimensional squares for the flowers. Like, they're so gorgeous. And I mean, her color choices are so bold and bright. I love to look at them. I don't know if I would wear it, but I love, love, love looking at it. And the idea of like working with really bright colors is, well, yeah, love that idea. But I, I know myself, like I'm something that's a lot of crazy bright colors. I just won't wear. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> I'm afraid I wouldn't wear it. So I wouldn't want to uh, head down that path. Though I love, I love seeing hers. It's really awesome. Okay, spinning. I finished spinning uh for this the spinning project that if um so here these are the two i actually did three skeins this week one is still a little wet um so i finished it this morning and soaked it so these are the three skeins that i spun this week they go together with the three skeins i spun last week so here are all of the except for the one wet cake um, yeah, so here, here are the five dry skeins and then the one that's a little wet. Um, the one that's a little wet, I spun a slightly differently. I had, um, I talked all about this in the last episode, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this now. And I also don't have any clips you may have noticed of me spinning, um, because it just, yeah, it just didn't happen. I just was, uh, spinning kind of randomly here and there I didn't I didn't think about uh setting up the camera to capture any but I will I'll have some footage if you like if you enjoy this spinning footage I'll have some spinning footage next time um from whatever it is I'm spinning uh, fiber from three different fiber vendors um all pretty much merino I pulled those together and actually I think one was something else merino merino what was the lcb I don't remember I'll put it on screen um, I think it was Targi. I think, it, yeah, they all work together. They, they spun well together. And, uh, I'm just going to hold it up here so you can look. I don't want to block my mouth in case someone needs to lip read what I'm saying. Um, yeah, so I took those three chunks of eight ounces and put them together in applying fashion. And I explained it pretty thoroughly last time. So I'm going to let you go back and watch that if this is news to you about this yarn. So I spun this yarn for the center point hoodie popover. It's got a hood. I think it's the center point popover. Uh, I just fell in love with that pattern and I didn't. I went sash diving and realized that I, I mean, I have no worsted weight sweater quantities except now I have this. Um, I just don't have any in my stash because I, as I said, I don't really knit with it much. So I have a couple single skeins that I probably bought to make a hat or other accessories. And, um, wow, it's really wet. <laughs> I was just going to pull this up and see how it looks. I think it goes well. It's a little bit, this is a little slightly darker than uh, these other five skeins because I had to switch the way I was spinning this because I ran out of um, the brightest yarn and the brightest uh, or fiber. The brightest fiber that I was using is um, I only had I had I was able to make 11 bobbins. It was from Frost Yarn and yeah. So when I got to the sixth skein, there was just one bobbin. So I was using two bobbins out of the four, two of these bright colors, and then. A, a very even solid blue and then another multicolor yarn that was blue family. Um, so that's why they're heavy blue. So yeah, the, the sixth skein has only one of those bright colors and then I use the two bobbins of the um, this multicolor. I think this is the Targi. 
So I do have a bit of this left because I had bought eight ounces and I think I used about two, three quarters of it. So I think I have about 50 grams left. Um, so I'm gonna just make a straight two ply with it and uh, use it for something else. Okay, that's spinning. All right. I have a pretty short little clip about uh, how I discovered um, for self-care. Uh, it is me telling you how I've managed to take care of my nails, both my toenails and my fingernails um, in the pandemic. I do have a condition. Uh, well, I'm not going to tell you more. I'm going to let you watch the clip where I explain it all. And um, yeah. that has a crack um, all the way from the tip to the cuticle and I think it's from keyboarding I think I with this hand this is my left hand I hit the keyboard on my computer right at that spot um, it's super annoying though because it will completely crack and open and snag on things, knitting included. Um, and it's really, really annoying. So I, uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, I bought this set, this um, gel manicure set, and uh, I started to gel manicure just this finger because um, it's a little less maintenance than having to do all my entire hand. And yeah, I don't mind it. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm gonna show you today. So this is the kit that I bought. It, it, I bought the UV lamp separately from this kit. You can see the cleanser and the soak off. Uh, what I'm doing now is just cleaning up the nail and getting it ready for polish. Um, they, it comes with little soak off foils too for you to remove the polish. And then I've bought a whole bunch of other um, polishes and things that you see here. Just collected them over the past year. Um, I'm filing and stuff. That's what you're seeing off screen. Uh, and then I'm going to just show you quickly that you coat the nail exactly the way if, if you weren't doing gel. It's just that in between you do this lamp for 60 seconds. And uh, because I'm just doing one hand, it's easy for me to kind of use my other hand to do other things. I'm just doing one hand and one finger, actually. I use the exact same setup to polish my toes. Um... This whole process takes about 10 minutes or so, and uh, yeah, it is really easy. I mean, it probably takes me about six minutes to do my finger and maybe like 10, 15 minutes to do my toenails. Um, my The split, the crack, is so much better. It's a really great way to maintain um, an issue like that because that issue really drives me crazy like snagging on everything clothes and it rips and it hurts when it rips yeah so i this is a way to avoid all of that by keeping gel polish on it gel polish lasts for about two weeks before i have to change it so it's really great all around okay i hope you enjoyed that uh little clip and Thank you so much for watching and so much for being here. Please uh, subscribe if you're not already a subscriber and you liked this series and uh, hit the thumbs up. That always helps. Also comment. I love comments. Please comment. Um, I love seeing them. I love responding to them. It helps me know what you're what you're enjoying, what you're you know what you're finding engaging, what parts you really liked. Some of the questions are so surprising to me, <laughs> but in a good way. Like, oh, I didn't realize anybody noticed that, but that's cool. Um, so yeah, I uh, look forward to sharing more with you in the coming weeks. I uh, should be back here in two weeks. I don't have any thing planned um and we'll do this again and we'll have some more stuff to show and share and talk about and yeah see what happens 